What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, let us know what you think about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you'd like to have on, we always love to see your feedback on there and then get those guests or topics covered on future podcasts. Today, I'm going to be joined by Carl from Gen Y Hitch. He's the founder of the company, and I wanted to talk with him about some new towing products that they've just released and also jump more into how they come up with products, the R&D, the testing, learn more about how they do what they do. So I'm sure it's going to be a great conversation. Before we get to it, though, I want to remind you our friends at Kershaw Knives have a 40% off MSRP code for you. If you use code 2020. For diesel 40 at kershaw.kaiusa.com. It's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear if you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, around the job site, around the house. They've got a ton of different choices for blade steel, blade shape, different handle designs, opening mechanisms. So definitely make sure and head on over to kershaw.kaiusa.com and use code 2024 diesel 40. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Carl from Gen Y Hitch talking about some new towing products they have and what goes into R&D testing and delivering new products to the towing marketplace. Carl, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast. I enjoyed our chat last year. It was really cool to hear how you started Gen Y Hitch and, and the process for it. And there were a lot of people that reached out to us and they found a lot of inspiration for it in in your story. So I thought it'd be cool to catch up with you again. There's been a lot of new products, new things that you guys have had since we chatted last. So welcome back to the podcast. Happy to be here. I, it's good to be back on here and, and chat with you. The, uh, gosh, it was last, last month. I know there were a lot of, uh, like trade shows and things like that. And one of the things that stood out to me was the snap latch coupler that you guys had released. Um, I saw some videos on it. I saw some articles on it. I wanted to ask you about that because I think our audience, diesel truck owners, they like to tow, they have toys and things like that. They're really going to be interested in that product if they haven't heard about it already. So I want to see if you could walk us through that product, what it does, and then maybe even how the idea came to create it. Well, I mean, obviously there's a lot of different types of uh, latching couplers out there. Uh, uh, you know, there's there's auto latch couplers. There's, you name it. I mean, they're available. Uh, a lot of what we did uh, on this uh, product was we took a bunch of different couplers that had one great feature about it, maybe three or four different ones, and we basically incorporated into one. That was kind of the goal when we started out. So, uh, like, we had been using an auto latch coupler. It worked fine, but uh, it uh, the coupler, the snap latch, has actually has a cone shape on the bottom where if your ball is off center a little bit, it slides right in the, the coupler. Well, the auto latch coupler we were using didn't have that cone. So the auto latch feature was great. It worked great, but it didn't have that cone. It was you had to be dead center, lined up, drop the uh, trailer down, and you have to hit the ball, you know. So it just gives you some room for error when you back underneath the ball uh, or underneath the trailer, I guess, the coupler. Uh, you can be off three inches to one side and still slides right in to the ball socket. So that was one thing. And another thing was uh, there's a lot of auto latches, but there's not many. Uh, when you unlatch a coupler, that it automatically resets to latch again. So that was another feature that was missing. So any pretty much all couplers that you see out there uh it had an auto latch the ones that have an auto latch feature for sure you uh you basically uh the auto latch features work fine but you always had to after you unhook the trailer you had to reset the coupler manually to engage the auto latch feature so we wanted to take out that step too where the snap latch, the way it operates is you have to unlatch it physically, right? But as the ball pulls out of that socket, it actually at the same time resets the handle to auto latch the next time you, you go to hook up again. 
So you don't have to manually reset anything or, or do anything like that. And that was one feature that we really liked on, on a few different uh, couplers. And we just basically took some of those top features that, that customers complained about and, and kind of built them all into one. Yeah. Well, I think that and, it, it's jumping out at me how convenient it would be <clears throat> if I was towing, having these features where I don't have to be exactly perfectly lined up. I'm sure mm -hmm. that wouldn't be fun to, you know, you, you got to yeah. take time to do it or the auto latch feature. So I see how it would fit into making my life easier as somebody towing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was kind of the, the, the background of it. It was more based on customer feedback and, and what they liked or disliked. We've, we've used multiple different brands of couplers over the years. And there was always something they didn't like about it. You know, there's, I mean, at the end of the day, you need something that locks onto the ball and doesn't come off, right? Yeah. That That's the goal uh, that we're trying to achieve. But also what we achieved in ours, the snap latch, is the uh, because it auto resets as you pull the ball out, you're not relying on me to go back and, and reset that handle so it latches again. So you take a human element out of it where there's room to forget to do that. Yeah. You back up the trailer, you let it down, and it's still in the unlatched position because you never reset it to latch again. So that part of it we eliminated uh, with the human error side of it. So you unlatch it once, you pull the ball out, you're done. You can hook up again and it latches. I mean, every time it, it's going to latch. I think for the safety and security side of it too, that would be really helpful and then comforting to know, especially like you talked about on the first, the first podcast is, you know, the approach you took with Gen Y when you started, it was, you might be using a bunch of different trailers, you might have different people driving the trucks, you might have all these different uses. And if you can take a human element out of it, make it convenient, mm -hmm. then it just works so smoothly. Oh, for sure. I mean, that that's a big part of what we do when we, we start the process of looking at new products, you know, what, what, uh, what are the, the pros and the cons of what we're trying to do here? You know, yeah. what are the likes and the dislikes and all that stuff? Well, then also the, the part that I really liked as well was visually, you can see when it latches and unlatches on the side of the, the side of the coupler and like it, you can right. visually, you know, just see it. So, you know, there's, there's kind of a few different ways to, to know and i thought i thought it was really cool and it kind of led me down another path which was to think how do you come up with these products like you know with your involvement with invention and r d and there's so much thought that goes into them i'm really curious what your approach is it or your approach to it is and then how you stay involved and creative in combining these things or coming up with a product or addressing these towing issues and, and problems that people have and giving them a solution? Well, I mean, obviously the, the, it originally where it kind of started is, is uh, kind of creating a solution for a problem I had, right? Yeah. That was where the whole thing started. And for me, I guess, you know, that thought process just kind of continued. Uh, you know, every time we look at getting this coupler, for example, we looked at getting a better coupler or encompassing all the pros that people like about any coupler. Like I said, there's a lot of couplers out there, different latches, different this, that, whatnot. But there's features that are missing on each one or, or could be added that this one has, but this one doesn't and and that customers like so it's kind of taken uh that type of approach where you where you look at a product and you you think about what are all the complaints that you've heard about this product you know start there and could it be could it be solved with adding a feature you know doing this differently or, or whatever it is 
you you could potentially solve that. And that, and that's kind of how we kind of start down the road. And then we, in a lot of cases, we actually physically uh, like seek out feedback. You know, we'll 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 know somebody that does a lot of towing, and we know they use a lot of this type these types of trailers, and we'll we'll ask them if you could have a perfect coupler, for example, again, if you could have a perfect coupler on every trailer, what would it look like? Tell me exactly what you would want. And that's kind of how I approach it a lot of times. It's, it's more a listening approach, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know you can get caught up in when you start thinking about, I want to create a new product. What is it? You know, it's in this space. First, you got to figure out the market space and then you think through that. And then what is the product? Then why are you creating the product? You know, you, you kind of got to ask yourself, why am I creating a product just to sell something and make it the same as everything else? Or am I wanting to create a product to try to solve a problem? Or, you know, improve a product, yeah. you know? That's also solving a problem. If you can improve a product, you're also kind of solving some issues, right? Uh, and that's kind of the approach we take when we look at new products. So we don't necessarily go out to, uh, there's all, all kinds of stuff we could build and make. We have the machines, we have the capacity, you know, we have, we have welders, we have everything we need to build any of these products, towing products in general. I'm thinking and but we don't necessarily do that uh, we we always look at a product and and kind of the why why are we building this product does it solve a problem does it does it uh, uh, fill a need for a certain thing in that space you know that towing application uh, that's kind of the type of approach we take I guess one of the things with it that really interests me <clears throat> is I, I love to be creative. I think a lot of us do. And no matter what type of industry, what type of job that we have, or even just as a hobby, we love to be creative. And one of the most rewarding things is when you think of an idea, and we'll keep it like in the business sense for a second, but you think of an idea, you put it together, you hear positive feedback from customers, positive feedback from the industry, it works. People love it. There's a certain fulfillment and energy that comes from that. But I think of the process of managing it. So say you have an idea and you sit down with your team. I think of the management of that. And you mentioned listening. How do you incorporate your team's feedback, their ideas? They might see something you don't see. They might have other ideas. It could just be in, like an incredibly creative meeting or a series of meetings. And it can kind of get, I don't want to say out of control, but you can go so many different directions that you kind of lose your focus. How do you manage that part of creativity? Well, I mean, usually uh, the first thing we, I mean, the team is, we got a smart team here. Uh, so back up a little bit. So, you know, when, it, when, when you're just talking about ideas, there is never a shortage of ideas from the team. So, so let, let, let's talk about that a little bit before we go into that. There is more ideas than we can ever execute on about new products, uh, improvements, you know, and, and a lot of times when we, when we, uh, when we look at a new product and we, we say, well, that, that's the direction we're going to go with this product because it, it's got to meet kind of three things I, I feel like. Uh, first, why, why are we doing it? it, it are, are we building a product just to build a product, an additional product, or are we building it to, to solve a problem? Kind of look at that. And then, then there's also the market size, right? You don't want to build something that you have the market, uh, you know, space for maybe a hundred customers. Yeah, you know, it's it, it, it's not worth the energy and effort unless it's a, some custom thing that you're doing. But that's kind of the the way we view it uh, from the get go, 
from the outset. We don't we don't necessarily go down that road if it doesn't really check all the boxes. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is is encouraging or how do you create the climate for encouraging people at Gen Y to share their ideas? And I'm asking this question because I know there's a lot of decent shop owners or just business owners that listen to the podcast and they'll sometimes ask us questions like, Hey, if you have somebody on, you know, chat about this or just different aspects of it. And I think that can be a, a challenging part that I don't know the answer to is how do you encourage employees to share their ideas and not be afraid to, to do it and just voice their opinions or maybe they see something or just not hesitate to, to bring it up in a meeting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's built from the ground up, you know, uh, it's how you build your culture around you. Uh, we, we want people to, to, we encourage people to, to want to be okay with making mistakes, you know, or being wrong. We don't like, we, it's kind of the culture aspect behind all that, you know, we have a great culture here. So automatically that opens the team up to kind of share their, their, uh, I mean, it's, it's not about just new products as well, but, it, but it's also things you dislike about what we're doing or not doing or, or everything. But like, it's pretty open. And when, when we sit down in a meeting, it's, it's very open and, and, you know, we, we have people in there that'll, you know, I, I absolutely hate this. You know, what, what, what are you guys thinking? You know, then we'll kind of talk about it. And well, at the end of the day, if, if it's, if it's not really not a good idea and they, they bring a point up that, that we haven't thought about, or, or, you know, I'm talking more like sales or marketing, they'll bring stuff up when, and when the engineering uh, team is kind of, trying to design something or build something. And well, that's something we didn't think about. Right. So it's kind of, it starts with the culture, the culture you build from the beginning or from the ground up, I should say, uh, is really what drives the openness. Would you say that that's the key to really everything whether it's R and D, whether it's sales, whether it's customer service, whether it's shipping, inventory, all the different aspects of a business is the culture. That's the key to making it all run and progress the way that you want to. Hundred percent. I, I feel like so many big corporations, public companies, they have gotten so far away from uh, the culture side of things. People, they've gotten so removed from people and what they actually do for the organization. So 100% uh, has everything to do with the people. The, the biggest expense line item on any company's uh, income statement is, is labor, right? We, we, everyone knows that. Why do you ignore the biggest investment you're making? Think yeah. about that. Yeah. Why do you ignore that? that part of it and, and, and not want to build your culture. Cause you know, they ultimately build the company with you. They're, they're part of the team. They're, they're part of the reason we are where we are. And I, and I, I would tell them that daily, you know, it, it's you're, you're the reason we're here. You know, you're the reason we're here. I, I mean, I'll, it's natural in here for all our leaders just to kind of think that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's such a, that's such a key component of it because there's so many situations or friends that I have or people that I know where they're not happy with what they do. It's because they don't feel valued. Then there's yeah. other people I know that are really happy because they feel valued. They're invested into what they do and they believe in it. And it changes everything. It changes their attitude, their productivity. It changes the work they do. It, it you know, to me, it stands out as a as a company. And I think that's one of the hardest things to capture because I think you're right. There, there's so many corporations out there where the culture doesn't really matter, and yeah. you see it as a consumer. You see it in the products. You mm -hmm. see it in how people react. And it's 
it, it's something that's forgotten. I wish it wasn't because it's it's so crucial. Mm-hmm. No, I agree. I mean, uh, even just you know, there. How many companies do you know that say you go on their website about us page maybe, and you'll see, oh, we know we have great customer service. We do this. We do that. Blah blah blah. Then you call in, and you end up, uh, you know in uh in queue for 20 or 30 minutes yeah if you ever get a call back (laughs) yeah if you ever get a call back or you know email them and you never hear from so you know it's all garbage everyone knows it right you know it it it, either you do it or you don't right uh people need to feel valued need to feel like they have a purpose for being here and you know circle back a little bit so uh you know talk about culture and and why you know why have they lost track of that so many times and i you know companies don't calculate you think about turnover so think about that just for a second you have uh, 50 percent turnover 60 percent turnover whatever whatever it is how much time, effort, and dollars do you spend on training new people, number one, and just the, the HR costs and all of that and hiring new people and all that? Uh, not only do you, you know, the, the resources you spend on training people, we don't, we never put a number to that. We do here, but I'm saying companies in general don't think about that. You're taking a a uh, person that was there, knows, you know, maybe he's been there for five, 10 years. And you're taking that person that is probably the most efficient person there in that area, and you're getting him to train somebody for a week, two weeks. Well, if, if your percentage of turnover is at 60, 50 percent, you're doing that every, like all the time. So you have a full-time experienced person that you're pulling away from his job, her job, and you're putting them here to train the new person. Not only are you losing the production of that person, the productivity from that person, you're also paying him to train someone now. So that new employee automatically costs you his salary, her salary, and the loss of what that person would have produced if he wasn't training. So it's almost a, like a, a a double effect on what it costs you. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does, yeah. And and I I've never I never hear companies they would prefer to pay people less and have 50 60% turnover. I'm like, why? The numbers don't even add up. They don't even make sense. Why <laughs> why not have zero turnover? Pay people more, build on your culture, so they want to stay here. Then you, well, I mean, the culture drives no turnover. So first, you have to kind of build up the culture uh, to what people really want to experience in a workplace. So that's just kind of my my thoughts a little bit on on why culture is so bad in a lot of these companies is is a uh, has to do with uh, pay probably a lot of times, you know, and they feel like they're saving money by paying people less, but in all reality, they're not. They're 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 spending more money in unproductive labor than they realize. I guarantee they are. We have done the math on this stuff. What also? You're, it, it, it even affects, you know, like the, the, the consumer or if you have like a, say, a, a retailer that works with you guys and they get used to working with one person and they work with that, that person for five years and then there's somebody new. Mm-hmm. And then six months or a year later, there's somebody new. There's somebody new. It does strain the relationship, your daily relationships, relationships with the truck owners who are calling in. And it, it's I don't understand it either, but it seems so common out there. And it creates frustration and it's just an unfortunate, it's just so unfortunate to see 
not just because of the products or the business, but then the personal experiences, which probably weekly I go through that. I send an email, don't hear anything. I call, don't hear anything, or I yeah. have to start over a bunch of times with it. And it's just frustrating. Yeah. Then if you get a new person, you have to kind of start over again with that, you know, and you, yeah, yeah I, I get it. It's, it's bad. You know, a lot of times we talk a lot about, uh, you know, so many companies talk about customer first, which is true to some degree. And, and I would, that's the goal, right? But how do you, how do you make the team make the customer be first? That's the tricky part. You know, I, I can sit here and say, we, we have the best customer service. And then I can preach to my team and say, just remember customer first, right? customer this, customer that. If I, on the backside, then don't have good or, or great internal customer service, you really think that person's going to treat your customer as, you know, the way I want them to be treated, customer first? I, you know, the management team, I, I myself included, we have to make the employees first. That needs to be on the top of our list. If we provide our employees with great customer service, what are they going to do in return? They're going to also provide the customers with great customer service naturally. We don't have to force anything. It's because that's how that's how the culture is is it's ingrained in them to operate that way. If they're, you know, with the company, they almost stand out to some degree, if they don't, you know, if you're being a jerk to a customer, you would really stand out around here. Yeah. Just naturally. It's not something we sit here and preach about, or, you know, we need to have great customer service. We, we hardly ever talk about it. It's just a natural thing that happens uh, by default, almost. One of the big parts of of customer service and products and everything to me is the shipping part of it because I can have a great experience on the phone or on the website, get my questions answered, find what I need. And then I also find just in being a consumer, sometimes the ball gets dropped on the shipping part of it where mm -hmm. maybe it doesn't ship for a week or 10 days or it something's something's wrong with it. So how does it extend to the, the delivery? Like you, you've had the idea, we talked about the coupler and there's tons of other products you guys have. The, the customer has a positive experience on the phone or via email with the questions they have. How do you also translate that to the logistical side of delivering it to the shop or the person who you know, orders on the website or calls in? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, uh, there's always going to be hiccups. You know, you, you got to view things like uh, anytime you have human beings involved in doing anything, there's going to be, here and there, you're going to have some problems, right? We're, we're all human. That's going to happen. So I guess we don't like, I go back to culture again and, and allowing people to make mistakes, you know, Allowing that to be part of the culture. They will only make the mistake one time. I, I don't even have to talk to them. Their manager don't even have to talk to them. They're, they're just naturally, I, I'll never do that again. I mean, there's always going to be issues like that uh, that come up. Uh, order gets missed. You know, it's, it's most times when there's an issue, it's with the logistics company where the package has left already here and it gets lost somewhere in three states away and nobody know how it knows how it got there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's probably more of the issues than anything. And then a lot of times, you know, the customers get upset about that and, and kind of blame us for it, which we don't, I mean, we, you just kind of take it with a grain of salt, but, but, you know, realistically, I, I think customers don't expect anyone to be perfect. They, they really don't. Uh, if, if it's a fair-minded person, they don't expect your company to be perfect 100% of the time. And 
I think that a lot of that has to do with how quick and and how enthuse, enthusiastically you want to resolve the problem. Is it the, the, the rep on the phone or, or whoever it may be that's talking to a customer that has an issue or is upset? How excited are you to solve that problem? You know, the, the goal there is to, to treat all those customers as if that is the only person you talk to today and you want to get this done for him. It's going to happen now. So, and, and again, we don't necessarily sit here and just talk about that stuff. It's just something that they take very personally. All of the, the team members here do. And they just kind of, that cannot happen. We're going to fix it. We're going to put a systems in place to fix it, or, or we're going to create this sort of uh, spreadsheet or, or process to, to not have that happen again. Like they're on it just like that. And this is just, you know, customer service team members doing it. If yeah, we're not, we're not telling them anything or pushing them to anything. They want to know people care. And that's what mm -hmm. I've found is if I <laughs> order something and there's mm -hmm. an issue, it's actually an opportunity that I have found if a company calls me and says, you know, Hey Patrick, this got delayed or wasn't done right. I'm making sure it gets done right now. I just wanted to let you know they can take that negative issue that happened or that setback, make it a positive and improve the customer service. And the reason I really wanted to chat about this is because I hear it so much from truck owners about customer service and it lacking in so many different parts of their truck ownership experience. And mm -hmm. I find the people who are starting companies, running companies, looking for answers. I don't get this sort of content, this, this sort of conversation very often, or I'm talking with the founder of a company and he's focusing on how I build this culture, how I put the customer first, the employees first. So I know people are going to find this really helpful. And so mm -hmm. I think that's incredibly important is just, if I know somebody cares, they can mess up. The shipping company can mess up. Maybe I messed up the order. I didn't right. place it right. But if I know somebody mm -hmm. cares, I'm a repeat customer. I tell somebody else, I tell them the experience that I have and it can turn into a positive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of the really cool things, um, I follow you guys on all your social media pages and I know it's the diesel podcast. We talk about diesel trucks and everything, but we also love power and performance. And I saw a mm -hmm. video, I think it was on Instagram where you guys have a bunch of Dodge Ram TRX trucks and I've driven one a few times. It is the most exciting gas powered vehicle, especially truck I have ever driven. And I was just curious for your, like what drew you to them? What, what was it? Was it, you know, like the power, the response, like the acceleration, what kind of drew you to that truck and, and get some of them for, for the company? Well, I mean, I, uh, I personally bought one to start with and I, I've wanted to, uh, or was thinking about buying one for probably a couple of years. Uh, I had a F F-150, I think, at the time. And I just needed something with a, with a little more power and a little more, like, oomph to it. I'm, I'm kind of that type of person uh, by nature. Uh, you know, uh, mud, snow, I, you know, I, I get crazy uh, out there. But... I first bought one and then, then my, my business partner, Dan, Danny, he, uh, after I bought mine, he, he decided to get one too. So, so that's how we, we end up with some, then we're like, well, we needed a new truck for the sales team. <laughs> so we're like, well, we'll just buy one for them too. Cause <laughs> like, like you said, they're, they're very fun to drive and uh, very fast and, and, uh, you know, any, anyone who tries to, to get you at the stoplight, you always put them behind you. That's always a surprise to them. So that's always fun to do because they don't, you know, some people don't know the, the abilities of that truck and what it actually has and the power it has off the line. So no, that's, that's kind of how we ended up with, with three of them. Uh, we actually did get one stolen here uh, about a month ago. Uh, at, at an airport in Chicago. So 
we're still trying to get all that resolved. Uh, or one of our salespeople had, had it parked there for a week. Actually, it was during, I say a month ago. I mean, a couple months ago. It was during SEMA, SEMA week. Oh, okay. And came back from SEMA and it was gone. The Midway Airport in Chicago. And yeah, the, it ended up the the cartel had it down in uh, the Mexico border. They caught him. They uh, pulled him over and we ended up getting the truck back uh, from there. So uh, that's just kind of an interesting side to that TRX. And we kind of found out later then you want to be careful where you take these trucks because there's people out there looking to to steal them. And they use them, I guess, for something down in Mexico. So, so we're a little bit careful now with where where we take them, and we got some hidden chips in them and that type of thing. So, yeah, they're really they're really fun trucks. I live in Colorado, so you know, being at a higher elevation, normally gas trucks just are not very exciting here because the lack of air, mm-hmm. and that's why you go to the diesel stuff. And driving one of those here, I'm like, this is so. It's so fun. Like I, this would be fun to go off roading with. Just have fun with. And mm-hmm. I saw you guys had some. And I was like, I, I bet people like to take those out to lunch or you know <laughs> go, go mm-hmm. uh, you know take it on a road trip or go to a show or something. So they really yeah. enjoy it. <laughs> no, we we thought it would be cool to have you know when you talk about uh, you know investing in your team again. And I'm just going to go there again with the TRX. Uh, we thought it would be cool to have the sales team have a uh, kind of a cool, cool looking truck, something that gets people's attention when you drive in uh, to go on the road. And that's what one of them is actually for that. It's for the sales team to go travel on the road. And we know we're going to put a ton of miles on it. And that was a plan. And that's and that's uh, and it kind of changes even their perception of they, they feel, it makes them feel good. You know, uh, if you do kind of invest in them in being able to do their job more effectively, I guess. It does. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's from start to finish and it's, and mm-hmm. it's, uh, it, it's something I, I've said before and we chatted last and some of the other podcasts, um, that I've done with you guys, it's just really impressive. And I love to be able to talk with you guys about culture, about products, um, about the atmosphere because I think the whole industry at large could really benefit from some of the things you guys have done, some of the lessons that you guys have learned to be able to create a better aftermarket. And mm-hmm. it was really cool to hear how you focus on culture and providing the customer with what they what they want. I, I, there's a ton of value in there um, mm-hmm. regardless of what we do. So I appreciate taking the time today to chat with me. I look forward to seeing you guys have different shows this year, being able to see new products that you come up with. I always stay tuned and get excited when I see a post. Cause I'm like, well, you know, what, what new product are they coming out yeah. with? And, mm-hmm. uh, and people ask us questions about them and they, and they want you guys yeah. on to, to answer them. So it was great to chat with you today. No, it was good to be here. Uh, good to talk to you again. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, we're definitely working on some, some very creative new products that you're going to see throughout this year, probably, a couple of them for sure uh, that are going to, again, going to fall into problem solving areas. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, you know, just just uh, looking forward to a great year again and, and uh, continued growth. So appreciate it. Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 2024-DIESEL40 for 40% off MSRP. Great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. If you need a knife for hunting, fishing, EDC, around job site, around the house, got a ton of choices for you, different opening mechanisms, different blade steels, different blade shapes. So they've definitely got you covered regardless of what sort of budget you have in mind. You can save some money, get some really cool gear with 2024-DIESEL40. Also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowen at 23 Diesel, John, J. Cole, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube podcast apps, follow us on social media. We appreciate all your support here in year eight of the Diesel Podcast and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you want to hear in 2024. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.